Hi everyone, welcome to my video on insulin and glucagon. So what we're going to do is you're going to be writing down the feedback loops for all of the hormones. So the first one we're writing down is insulin. Um, so you might want to pause the video and just um, get a kind of general idea of the layout of the feedback loop before I begin um, filling in all of the blanks. So insulin is dealing with um, the glucose that you have in your blood and putting it into your cells or using it and storing it somewhere so we can use it later. So we talked about in class how important glucose is to your body. You know that you need glucose in order to make ATP, which our cells use um, in order to have energy. Without glucose, um, without ATP, we wouldn't be able to do anything. You would die. So it's a really, really, really important hormone that we have. Um, and this is how it works. So we're starting in the bottom left-hand corner. So the very first thing that's going to happen is... We're going to eat some sort of meal. So whether this is you eating breakfast in the morning or lunch or dinner or snack, um, you're eating some sort of food. And we know from Bio20 that everything that we eat um, is made up of macromolecules, so whether it's proteins, lipids, or carbohydrates. Um, so we're talking specifically about our carbohydrates. So you have maybe a starch or a glycogen that you're eating in your food. Um, maybe it's a super starchy food like a potato. And so you're taking that into your body. And we know our digestive system, so we go into our stomach um, and then into our small intestine. And in our duodenum, we're going to take in um, some glucose. So we're breaking down that starch into glucose. So what's going to happen is that glucose is going to travel from our small intestine into our blood. So what's going to happen, it's going to increase um, our blood glucose levels. Okay, Because all of that glucose is now traveling in our blood. So when that happens, um, because our body likes to maintain homeostasis um, and it sees an increase in blood glucose levels, um, we don't want it to go too high. But we also don't want it to get too low. We always kind of want to maintain our blood glucose levels kind of um, at a certain level, which you guys don't need to know, but it's uh, we want to maintain it. So there's going to be fluctuations when you eat um, or if you haven't eaten for a while. Um, and when we see a really large increase, um, what – happens is our body is going to signal our pancreas. So inside our pancreas we have cells called um, the islet of Langerhans cells um, and you also have a beta and an alpha. So what's going to happen is it's going to signal our pancreas in the beta part of the islet of Langerhans and that is going to re signal a release of insulin. And what insulin is going to do, we have a different, a few different options. So the first thing it's always going to do is it's going to basically go into all of our body cells. And just like any of our cells, um, there's channels on the outside that connect to our bloodstream. So what it's going to do is it's going to increase the permeability of those body cells and allow glucose to go into our body cells. So I'm just going to switch the slide here for a second. You should also draw this picture. So what I'm showing you here is just kind of a little diagram of what I'm talking about right now. So we have our blood vessel. So imagine you have a whole bunch of glucose right here in our blood vessel, um, a capillary or an artery, um, whatever. And this is showing you your glucose channel. So you'll notice that it looks um, similar to what you had in the neuron um, those channels that allowed sodium and potassium into the neuron. Okay, but I'm talking these are just allowing glucose into your cells. This is my mitochondria. Um, so what's going to happen is glucose is going to eventually be allowed through those channels, go into our mitochondria, and we're going to have cellular respiration happening. Okay, and then this is just showing me my body cell. So we have Glucose in the blood vessel, it goes through the channel once insulin tells the channel to open, and then it will go into my mitochondria, be used in cellular respiration to produce a whole bunch of ATP okay, inside of my body cell so I can do whatever process I need ATP for. So that is what the main thing insulin does. Okay, it's burning my glucose by actually using it in cellular respiration. And when that happens, when I go and take a bunch of glucose from my blood vessel and put it into my cell, 
what's happening is it's going to be a negative feedback loop and cause a decrease in blood glucose, causing it to go back to normal. So it's no longer going to be stimulating my pancreas. Okay. And that's why it's the negative feedback loop because it's turning that mechanism off by, by seeing a decrease in blood glucose. So for whatever reason, maybe you've eaten a really large meal that's super sugary and you already have all of your cells are filled with glucose and they don't need any more sugar at that time. What happens is um, step two. So if we have our cells all filled with glucose, um, we don't want to get rid of the glucose. We don't want to pee it out um, because glucose is so important. Our bodies are hoarders and we're going to do something else and we're going to save that glucose so we can use it later because we might not have a meal for a really long time after this. And we want to make sure that we have glucose available to ourselves because otherwise we won't be able to get ATP and our cells aren't going to be able to function. So we really need to make sure that we have glucose available. So the second thing we're going to do is we are going to store our glucose as glycogen in either my liver or my muscles. Okay, glycogen, if you remember from Bio20, is literally just a long chain of glucose. If I store it as glycogen, okay, my body's not going to allow it into my cells because glycogen is too large of a molecule. So it's either in my liver or my muscles, and I can use that later. So again, I'm taking glucose from my blood. I'm putting it somewhere. So again, it's going to allow a decrease in my blood glucose back to normal, and it's no longer going to be stimulating my pancreas. So again, it's a negative feedback, okay? The only problem with this is, unfortunately, your body in your liver and your muscles, ima imagine it's a filing cabinet. And just like if I was going to take my filing cabinet and open the files, um, there's only a limited amount of space that I can put paper. Okay, so the same idea, you have a filing cabinet in your liver, a filing cabinet in your muscles that allow you to store glycogen, but there's only a limited amount of space. So if you have all of your cells are already full of glucose because you've ate a really sugary meal. Then you go and store all of that glucose as glycogen, and there's no more longer space in the filing cabinets. Um, you have a third option as well. Your body is a serious hoarder, so they're working their way around peeing out that glucose because that's not helpful, and we really, really, really need glucose. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to store that glucose as fat. Okay, so. Remember back to the idea of chomps. So every single macromolecule that you have in your body is made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So basically, I imagine this as you have a whole bunch of ingredients in your fridge. Okay, I can actually make any of the macromolecules as long as I have the proper ingredients. So glucose is made out of just carbon hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, in order to make a fat molecule, I just need carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as well, but in different proportions. Okay, so as long as I have the proper ingredients, rather than making glycogen this time by just basically packaging a bunch of glucose together, I can change the proportions of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen and store it as a fat molecule. Okay, because our bodies are hoarders. We don't know when then our next meal is coming. Okay, evolutionary speaking, I'm talking about when we were cavemen. And you could eat at certain periods of time, but you never knew when your next meal was coming. So your body had to be really, really efficient at storing the glucose. So again, I'm taking that glucose from my blood. I'm storing it in some way. I'm going to be taking it away from my blood, so I'm going to decrease my blood glucose levels, and again, turn off that, that mechanism that's stimulating my pancreas. So it's a negative feedback loop. So that is insulin. Okay, It's a really, really, really important um, hormone in our body. So the opposite hormone that we have in our body is called glycogen. So again, maybe to pause the video, and you might want to just write kind of the basic structure of the diagram before I go and start writing down the information. So glycogen is the opposite situation. This time, um, what's happening here is I'm going to skip a meal. So, or just maybe I haven't eaten for a really long time. So maybe I'm sitting in biology class right before lunch and I'm getting super, super hungry. I start to get to the point where I'm getting a little hangry. 
And what's happening is um, you're basically experiencing a decrease in your blood glucose levels. Your body can actually feel this. So when you're actually hangry, um, it's because you're not at homeostasis. So you might start to feel maybe a little shaky, a little bit lightheaded. Um, and this is going to be because you have a decrease in that blood glucose levels in your blood. So what's going to happen is you're going to stimulate the pancreas again. This time you're going into the alpha cells of the islet of Langerhans inside your pancreas. And what they're going to do is they're going to cause a release of another hormone. Okay, this time it's going to be called glucagon, which is the opposite of insulin. So the whole point of glucagon is to basically take glucose and put it back into our blood. So remember we had two different storages or storage containers of glucose. So we had it as glycogen and we had it as fat. So we're going to go back and we're going to basically take that glycogen or that fat and put it back into our blood. So the first thing we're always going to do is we're going to tap into our liver and we're going to, or our muscles, and we're going to take that glycogen that was stored and break it down into glucose. So again, glycogen is literally just a long chain of glucose. So it's breaking the bonds between the glucose molecules and putting all of that glucose into our blood, which again, if it, I was originally having a decrease in my blood glucose, I'm having an increase back to normal. That's going to turn off this mechanism and go back to normal. So again, imagine I have filing cabinets and I'm emptying out all the filing cabinets. I'm physically taking out all of the glycogen or the papers in my filing cabinets. Eventually I'm going to run out of papers or glycogen in my filing cabinets. So once that happens, I can go into my second storage container, which is my fat molecules. So I'm going to actually go into my fat and I'm actually going to break it down back into glucose. So again, I just need to have the proper proportions. We all know glucose is C6H12O6. So I just have to have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and um, six oxygens from my fat molecule. I can make glucose again. And then I'm going to put it into my blood, which is going to cause an increase in blood glucose. And it's going to turn this mechanism off. So that is why it's a negative feedback loop. So because this is a lot of information, I suggest that you write these things out a couple of times because otherwise it's not going to stick into your brain. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, we are good to go. Um, good luck and see you guys tomorrow.